It is well with my soul. Brought to you by Baptist Temple Church in San Antonio, Texas. We are a part of a family of churches and service organizations sharing a large strategically located campus to meet the spiritual and physical needs of our community. Well, good morning and welcome. Did I turn this thing off? Yes, I did. Okay. I'm so glad that you're here today. This is a very unusual moment, of course, in the life of uh, our city, our world, and our church. Let us uh, go before the Lord in prayer. Gracious Lord, we're so thankful for your grace and your mercy at this time. when We beseech you, Lord, for your protection of our health and for those in our community. We pray for our leaders, Lord, that you guide them in wisdom and keep them from fear. Lord, we pray for these people that are suffering today, people that are suffering from illness, people that are suffering from isolation, people that are suffering hunger, people that are suffering fear. Father, we lift them up to you, that you surround them with your love, that at this point you make yourself real to them and give them an extra measure of grace. Lord, we pray for health, and we pray for your peace to surround us. For this we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Dionne Warwick. I don't know how many people remember her, but she was a, a big deal with Hal David and Burt Bacharach songs. They almost always were written for her, but she said it was too preachy and didn't want to sing it. Too preachy. What the world needs now is love, sweet love. But you know, Jesus said that so long ago. He said, a new commandment I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, 
Everyone will know you're my disciple if you love one another. It's an old idea. But the love Jesus spoke about was an active type of love. It was love in action. You see, the Greeks had several words for love. Married love, friendship, these different types of words. So they wanted to be, so they, they wanted to be very specific about it. And so Jesus chose this word agape, which means a love in action. So and Jesus was very specific about this because apparently this was very confusing back then. It was confusing to Dion Warwick. And it seems to be confusing to Christians today. So Jesus specified who we're supposed to love. So he says, love your brother. Okay, that's pretty simple. I don't know why we have to be reminded of that. But uh, the, uh, John the Apostle said, if anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother, who can he, he can see, he cannot love God who he does not see. Hmm. That's interesting. In fact, Jesus said that you cannot worship if you do not love your brother. He said if you're going to go to worship, bringing an offering, just leave that offering for a minute. Go be reconciled to your brother because you cannot come before God if you have something against your brother. That's in the Bible. Uh, people, I can tell people may not read the Bible too much because how can a Christian be so hateful to another Christian, to a brother? Can you imagine how much how they must behave towards someone who's not a brother or they consider a brother? So we hear about business meeting fights. I don't know if this is true or not, but I've heard the story about the deacons who went out to the parking lot and got to a fist fight over the color of the carpet. I don't know if that story is even true because I've heard it so often. But the sad part is that it just sounds so true, doesn't it? One here. Ugly gossip. You know, apparently when the phone was invented, some Christians shouted hallelujah. Because now I don't have to wait till Sunday to talk badly about another Christian. I can just get on the phone. Folks, if your phone is ringing off the hook with gossip, you need to ask yourself, why are they calling me? And of course, the feuds of Christian against Christian. The question I ask is not how can one person calling himself a Christian hate another. The question is, how can an entire church that calls themselves Christians tolerate such behavior? Folks, you ought to be embarrassed if you were a Christian in a Christian church to bring gossip to another person. You ought to live in fear that that person might call you out. But sometimes it's not so. Okay, so love, love your brother. I guess we can handle that, right? From now on, we love our brother. But then he said, love your neighbor. Hmm, okay, I, I think I can do that. But, you know, one lawyer asks, because he's a lawyer, of course, uh, who is my neighbor? You know, we need to be more specific. Who is my neighbor? Because we think of neighbors, and in the Bible, our brother is another, a fellow Jew. A neighbor is someone who is not necessarily, but we're friendly towards, right? So he's got to look a lot like us. And so Jesus answered that question by telling this odd story. He tells the story of a man who's beaten up and left for dead, and people who are his brothers pass him by. But yet the Samaritan, an outsider, just think in terms of a different race and a different belief system. Perhaps today he'd be a Muslim. And he stopped and helped the guy. He didn't know who this guy was, but he helped him anyway. And then he asked, who was the neighbor here? Hmm. Wow. You know, Mr. Rogers is famous for wanting to be your neighbor, right? I'm sure the song is starting to circulate in your head right now. I hope so, because I'm not going to sing it. <laughs> but there's one scene that keeps getting played over and over again where Mr. Rogers invites the, the mailman, a black guy, to soak his feet with him together in this little kitty tub to cool off. Folks, that was definitely a mark that 
Mr. Rogers wanted us to understand that this black man was his neighbor. All right, all right, we get it now, right? Some of you here have beautiful hearts and are going to love your brother and are going to love your neighbor. You get it. Those are things they wanted to see one. And all of a sudden, Jesus stops, turns around and says, who touched me? Kind of something that I might ask somebody to touch me in a crowd. Hey, especially nowadays. But he said, who touched me? And there was this woman who was sick. She had an issue of blood. And he stopped on his way to something important. A woman that was so unimportant. She was an outcast to society. And yet, he stopped for a moment and he blessed her. He blessed her. He didn't have to bless her. Wasn't it enough that he healed her? But he stopped and his important duties turned around and blessed her in front of the crowd. You know, there was an important teaching moment that he was going to have in healing of this woman, of this girl, that, uh, the important man's daughter. But he taught another lesson, that no one is so unimportant that God doesn't have time for them. In fact, the important man's daughter died. They said, you're too late. Don't worry about it anymore. But he went and he raised her. He raised her from the dead. Very important lessons that Jesus was teaching in these important teaching moments. He also taught that love was sacrificial. You see, it wasn't nails that held our Lord to the cross. It was his love. His love was so great that he forgave those who were crucifying him. Talk about forgiving your enemies. Love is a mark of a Christian. It demonstrates God's existence to those people who don't believe. And 1 John it says, No one has seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is made complete in us. Loving one another reflects, reflects Christ. Our passage this morning, a new commandment I give you, love one another as I have loved you. You must love one another. By this all men will know that you're my disciples, by you, that you love one another. I don't have any problems with this. I understand it. But yet some of my brothers and sisters, I love them. But they think that our faith is demonstrated in how smart we are and how quickly we can argue a theological point, and by identifying who we are denominationally. But the children, well, this is uh, in first, how it's written in 1 John. This is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not a child of God, and anyone who does not love his brother is not a child of God. This is the message you heard from the beginning we should love one another. How come this keeps being repeated in the Bible? Are we maybe having trouble getting it? I don't know. How about, are you known for your love? Do you leave a trail of love behind everywhere you go? When you arrive somewhere, are people happy to see you? You know, they say, hey, Norm! Well, they don't say the hey part. Or are they happy to see you leave? What is the legacy that you are leaving? Saw a movie uh, a couple of nights ago about a man named Damien DeVoster. He's better known as Father Damien. This is a priest who, vol who volunteered. He desperately wanted to go to Hawaii back when it was called the Sandwich Islands, back when it was first opened in the late 19th century, to be a missionary to the pagans who lived on that island. He wanted to bring them into the household of God that they may enjoy paradise and not go to hell as they were bound to go because they did not have Christ. He wanted to be a missionary. <coughs> and when he got there, he was a hard-working guy. In fact, it was difficult for him to become a priest because they didn't think he was very smart. And he could learn Latin and all the priestly things he had to know. Uh, but he did that. And, you know, it turns out, that for some reason, they have to tell us this, that he's five foot eight and weighs more than 200 pounds. And every bit of muscle 
And so he was a hard worker and he built chapels and he did all this stuff. And then the word came out that there was a colony of lepers that were isolated and that they did not have a priest, that they didn't have anything. They were just dropped on that island and were abandoned. And so Father Damien volunteered to go and be their chaplain. This is a one-way ticket, folks. Once you got there, you were not allowed to leave that island because you might be infected. And so he decided to go there, and he built them houses, and he fought with the authorities because they were not on his side. Not the authorities of Hawaii, not the authorities of his church, and not even the, the islanders. Everybody was against them. They were afraid of these people because nobody knew how you got leprosy. And they were afraid they'd catch you, so these people were isolated. But he did have friends, and he got a lot of money. A lot of money was sent, a lot of lumber was sent, and in the 16 years that he lived on that island, he built homes for them, he built hospitals. He fought and he fought and he fought until he got other priests and, uh, and people to come and minister to these people as they were dying. They would be abandoned and allowed to die at the last minute. And there were bullies there who would take advantage of the weak and they would steal from them. But Father Damien's love compelled him to go and give his life for these people of the islands and make a better world for him. You know, I know you've heard of Mother Teresa. Love drove her into the city of Calcutta. And what people don't know is that in the early days of her ministry there, she's living on the streets with these poor and in huts and hovels. And it would have been so easy for her to just to go back to the convent and have a nice bed there and have some meals. You know, I'm sure that monks and nuns live a very simple life and a very difficult life. But boy, it seemed like a luxury for her living in Calcutta. And she began to care for the abandoned, for the poor. And you know, those people that she was caring for, they weren't Catholic. They weren't Christian. They were Hindu, if anything. And she loved them, and she cared for them. And she built a place for them where they could die in peace and in dignity. She moved to Calcutta to care for the hungry, the naked, the homeless, the crippled, the blind, the lepers. All those people who feel unwanted, unloved, uncared for throughout society. The people who become a burden to the society and are shunned by everyone. In 2002, three Southern Baptist medical missionaries, Kathleen Garrity, Bill Cohn, and Martha Myers, were murdered in a hospital in Yemen. Love had compelled them to give their lives to ministry. Love had compelled them to go and minister to the, to, in a hospital in the Muslim nation of Yemen, among Muslim peoples, to show them that God loved them so much that he sent people there to care for them, to take care of them. At the funerals, one of the Southern Baptist mission leaders said that this terrorist did not take their lives. They had surrendered their lives to Jesus long before. But no one took their lives. They gave up willingly. From the beginning, the church was led by crazy, Christ-centered, Holy Spirit-driven Christians <clears throat> who had a love that no one could understand. A love that was a stark contrast to the self-centered, fear-driven Roman world. During the third century, a plague broke out in North Africa. And the Romans were so afraid of the plague and so afraid of dying that they would take their family members, their children, their parents, grandparents, siblings, and they would put them out in the street when they were dying from the plague and allow them to die there alone and abandoned. They were so afraid. But the Christians were not putting out their dying, and they were burying their dead. In fact, they gathered the dying from the streets and brought them in and took care of them and ministered to them. And they took the, those that were dead in the streets and they buried them and gave them decent, human, Christian burials. And because of that, people began to convert to Christianity at that point. Why? Because they saw this crazy love. Sometimes, 
I think, maybe you do too, that love, it's just enough not to hate somebody, right? I think it's an extreme act of love sometimes that I don't reply to a strange tweet or a Facebook message. I think, boy, how much love do I have that I'm just going to let this go? But then I read these accounts of the third century Christians. And I know that these third century Christians were the ones that inspired Father Damien and Mother Teresa to go out there and give their lives. What were they saving it for? Charles Spurgeon, you might have heard of him, the Prince of Preachers. He is known for being this awesome preacher that from a very young age would preach these sermons that people would come to see. He was the first megachurch pastor at the Metropolitan uh, Tabernacle in London. But you know, when he was 19 years old and he first came to that church in London, a pl the cholera broke out in the city of London and people began to move out. They went out to the country because they didn't know what caused cholera. But they didn't know that the open air was better, so they left the city. Charles Spurgeon was 19 years old in the first year of his ministry. Stop and think about that for a minute. 19 years old, and he's pastoring this church. And he decided that he can't leave. He can't leave these people on their own. And so he stayed behind to preach in his uh, chapel and to go out and visit the dying, as they called and wanted to see a pastor in their last days no one else would go he went with them he visited the sick at the risk of his own life <coughs> you know in 1956 Jim Elliot and four of the missionaries were killed by a tribe in Ecuador 1956 this is a tribe that was among the most primitive people untouched by society and he and four of the missionaries went over there to try to reach them and out of fear, the missionaries killed them. It was love for Jesus and love for the lost that compelled Jim Elliot to go. He had once written in his journal, a man is no fool to give up that which he cannot keep for that which he cannot lose. Love compelled his widow, Elizabeth, and another female missionary and their young daughter to, re to stay with that tribe and continue to witness and to minister to them. When asked to reveal what the greatest commandment is, Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your, hope, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. The second is important still. Love your neighbor as much as you love yourself. All the other commandments and the demands of the prophets stem from these two laws and are fulfilled if you obey them. Keep only these and you will find that you're obeying all others. We live in a time of fear. And the only thing that can combat fear is love. I know that there are churches that are not meeting today because they feel it's too soon. I don't know what that means. I know that the biggest fear we have out there is that people might die. And I'm afraid that I have bad news for you. People are going to die of something. Last night, I think, this weekend, four people, maybe more, were murdered. They were murdered. I don't know what they were doing, but they weren't going to church. Uh, we, if the Bible tells us, don't fear the one that can touch the body. Fear the one that can touch the soul. It's an unfortunate use of words now that I'm trying to say, don't fear. <laughs> but trust in the Lord and lean not on your own understanding. I do not believe that we need to be taking any risks but I do believe that what, we were, that what we were told, the reason we closed for those Sundays was because we needed to flatten the curve and we needed to make sure that the hospitals were ready, that there were enough masks, that there were enough uh, ventilators, there were enough everything and enough medicines to be able to heal and help the people that get sick. 
And I, I praise God that by His mercy, we have reached that point. So, uh, out of love, we need to react to and respond to one another. And, you know, at the very least, love is displayed in not saying hateful things about others. I know that not everybody is ready to come back to church, and that is okay. We need to come back only when we're ready. I'm blessed by your presence here. These difficult times of coronavirus, Baptist Temple is alive and well. We are doing what we have always done, reaching out to our community to meet their needs. We are connecting with our members by teleconferencing, an online worship service, and by telephone. God is not finished with Baptist Temple. And after this pandemic is over, we will emerge from this stronger than ever. You can send your tithes and offerings to Baptist Temple, 901 East Drexel Avenue, San Antonio, Texas, 78210. Or go to our website at www mybtsa.org that's www.mybtsa.org and click on the donate button to donate with PayPal. Always remember this, be strong in the Lord and be of good courage. May God bless you.